This is the last time Dermot O'Neill was seen before he was shot dead. These pictures have never been broadcast before. Three and a half hours later, heavily armed anti-terrorist officers moved in to arrest an IRA bombing team. This operation, captured by a surveillance camera, shows them entering a Hammersmith hotel. Moments later, they attempted to get into room 303. What happened next was recorded. The biggest surveillance operation ever mounted by the Metropolitan Police ended here when an unarmed member of an IRA gang was shot six times. Last month, a jury ruled that Dermot O'Neill was lawfully killed. He was a member of a team that was planning to plant bombs across London, and in the weeks leading to his death, his every move was watched. So what happened in the early hours of the morning when an elite firearms unit came to arrest him? Tonight, using secret recordings and footage never broadcast before, Spotlight investigates the life and death of Dermot O'Neill. Dermot O'Neill's last moments were spent almost naked, lying on a pavement he had walked along a thousand times before. The Premier West Hotel on Glenthorne Road in Hammersmith was a familiar haunt. He had spent all his life in that part of London. Born and raised in England of Irish parents, he spoke like a Londoner. At six foot two, with distinctive ginger hair, he was a familiar face in local bars and shops. In the mid-1990s, he met Carmele Arino. From the Basque country, she had come to London to work as an au pair. She became his girlfriend, and they moved in together, eventually planning to marry and move to Spain to set up a business. This is the first time she has spoken on television about their relationship. Dima was a Republican. Definitely was a Republican. He could not understand people in Ireland being treated the way they were treated for the sake of being Irish. He couldn't comprehend that. And he used to get upset about it and just keep out about it. He did. He felt for them, even though he wasn't born there, he did feel for them. You weren't shocked or surprised to discover that he was in the IRA? I was, I was. I was shocked. Because you think, you know, like I said, that from my experience, you are out with people and then you find somebody you lived with, somebody who's been very close to you. And you haven't known anything, you haven't noticed anything. I wasn't out of respect. But these things happen. Dermot O'Neill's political apprenticeship began in his teens. He sold newspapers, attended rallies and marches, and helped raise money for prisoners' relatives. And he had impeccable Republican credentials. Back in 1918, his great-grandfather was a Sinn Féin MP and a close friend of Eamon de Valera. Although the O'Neill family made London their home, holidays were always spent in Ireland, much to the delight of Dermot and his younger brother Shane. I remember trips to Donegal. We used to have a cottage up in Donegal. Um, just mount, it was right beside the sea. Um, a 200-year-old cottage, you know, and us coming over from London to the extremes now we're in a three-roomed cottage by the sea at, um, at the foot of a mountain you know it was just beautiful and we just had fun all the time you know just had a laugh if holidays were spent in ireland school days were spent here at the oratory one of london's most well-known catholic schools made famous when the prime minister decided to send one of his children there although dermot was four years older he and shane were very close he was, he was always good to me, he was, he was great to me. It wasn't a case of, um, you hear all these stories about brothers, you know, you know, um, picking on their little brothers and stuff. I was never treated that way. I was um, looked after all the time. 
As he grew up, Dermot O'Neill became increasingly fascinated with Irish politics and culture, much to the surprise of others in Hammersmith's Irish community. I was quite amazed how, how Irish he was, because his parents were definitely not over-emphatic about the, the Irish origins or something like that. They, um, you know, they just participated in normal community activities, and uh, their children similarly, like uh, Siobhan became a, a nurse and a sister in the local hospitals, etc., in Kensington and Chelsea Hospital, and they grew up as a normal family, but not over-emphasis, and I think it was, you know, a great surprise to all of us that, uh, that he was so involved. This is where Dermot O'Neill's secret world first served. In 1988, he joined the Bank of Ireland as a clerk at its Shepherd's Bush branch, but his career in banking was short-lived. A year later, he was found guilty of embezzling £75,000, half of which was moved to a bank account in Belfast, believed to be linked to the Republican movement. After his release from a young offender centre, he took a series of maintenance jobs and appeared to be settling down, away from the gaze of the authorities. But in 1996, he found himself back under the spotlight. The Metropolitan Police has never dismantled its ability to respond quickly to this kind of incident. In February of that year, two people died and dozens were injured when an IRA team planted a lorry bomb at Canary Wharf. The bombing put pressure on the security services and surveillance was stepped up on IRA activists and sympathisers living in England. In the days that followed, checkpoints brought London to a standstill and all police forces across England were on high alert. Although Dermot O'Neill wasn't involved in the Canary Wharf bombing, the increased levels of surveillance that followed would ultimately put him under scrutiny. In August, Brian McHugh from Fermanagh and Patrick Kelly from Longford were spotted on a security camera at a tube station. The pair were then seen in the company of Dermot O'Neill. They were also joined by James Murphy, a friend of O'Neill's who was a school groundsman and lived in Chelsea. Stand by, I have contact, both chatting towards the vehicle. McHugh, seen here on the left, was the leader of the unit. He was given the code name Cabbage White by watching officers. O'Neill was the quartermaster, and for some time he'd been amassing weapons and explosives. He was known as whistled tune. Cabbage white towards the passenger side. Having a look back into vehicle, video time 939. Using an alias of Ray Wilkinson and posing as a haulage contractor, Dermot O'Neill rented this lock-up garage in Hornsey in North London. In it was stored six tonnes of homemade explosive, two pounds of Semtex, power units, detonators, three AK-47s, and two handguns. Once the security services became aware of the rented lockup, a network of police teams and MI5 officers were put on the gang's tail in a plan codenamed Operation Tinnitus. Contact coming up to the junction of King Street. Slowly, the security services began to build up a picture of what the gang were planning. As Dermot O'Neill and his colleagues moved around London, they knew there was a high chance they were being watched by the authorities, so they attempted to take precautions. They would vary their routes, retrace their steps, and use false names when speaking on the phone. Meetings were arranged via electronic pagers, and code words were used, but their anti-surveillance techniques didn't work. Patrick Kelly, seen here in the checked shirt, booked into the Butlins holiday camp in North Wales under an assumed name. But the false trail didn't deceive the authorities and he was watched at every turn. Police put Dermot O'Neill's house under observation. They also watched James Murphy's movements and placed a camera outside the Premier West Hotel where Brian McHugh and Patrick Kelly were staying. They wanted a lorry to pack a bomb into. After countless phone calls, many to Castle Blaney, they found one.